In the book of Job, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, we read these words. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to welcome you this morning to Bethany Congregational Church as we gather together to worship the Lord, and today we also remember the life of Janet Fukumura, a longtime member of our church, and, um, and so we honor and remember her today, and so I'd like to welcome each one of you and thank you to those who are also attending through Zoom and through our, our live streaming as well. Uh, we have had the announcements uh, posted up before the service has begun, and so I hope those who've been sitting uh, in the sanctuary have taken the time to read those, but there are a few things that I would like to highlight. You may notice that your bulletin this morning came with a bunch of inserts, and so I'll quickly go over those. One, of course, is the pastor's insert for uh, the message this morning on how to divorce-proof your marriage and love your friends. There's also a, a full sheet that's folded in half that says Mom's Tribute, and this is um, the tribute that Glenn Fukumura shared at Janet's uh, graveside service, and he wanted to share that with the congregation, so we've printed that out so you can read Glenn's tribute, and then finally, um, the uh, church uh, is, has been gracious to uh, host a bridal shower for, incidentally, for my fiance, uh, Yurika, on October 16th, and so please RSVP to Natsuki by October 10th. Um, just a couple other brief things. Next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And we will, it's, we've been kind of spotty on this, but um, I just want to make this announcement that we will be collecting for the assistance fund, um, which uh, is made available to those uh, who, uh, in our congregation who may be needing some financial assistance. And so we would like to be faithful in contributing to that. Uh, in the past, we have collected it in a basket, one of the ushers has held a basket, but uh, with COVID and everything else, we've decided that we'd like to ask you to designate on your check or you know, if you put cash in an envelope and just put assistance on there and then put it in the regular offering box. So a little confusing, but that's how we're, we're going to collect for the assistance fund next week. Yesterday was a special birthday for Amina and she has uh, graciously provided um, some special goodies after the service, some cupcakes and pizza, I think. So we want to celebrate Amina's birthday as well. And so happy birthday, Amina, and thank you for providing some special treats for us. We do have uh, some continued prayer requests, as you can see on that, that third fold in the bulletin, and we'll be we will be praying for those uh, during the congregational prayer. Our missionary focus this morning is the Ramabai Mukti Mission. They are in India, and um, they've been ministering to women and children in particular for many years, and our church has had a decades-long partnership with the Ramabai Mukti Mission, so we are grateful for that, and we want to continue to support them, uh, not only financially, but uh, with our prayers as well. And they've, um, in their newsletters, expressed some of the challenges they've experienced with COVID and, and ministry. And of course, India, as we know, was where that Delta started. So I'm sure they've, they've felt the effects of that as well. So we do want to pray for them. At this time, are there any um, praise reports or prayer requests from the congregation? Anyone would like to share this morning? Okay, with that, uh, let us go in to a time of prayer. 
Gracious God, we thank you for gathering us together this day to worship you. And we thank you for the privilege that we can come together as believers in Christ and we can, um, we can worship you together corporately, Lord. And Father, we do continue to uh, lift up those in our congregation, Father, who need your healing touch today. We remember Canaan and Bobby and Alyssa and Lucille and Aaron Gray, John Slagle, um, Andrea, Tammy. Father, we uh, continue to lift up Lloyd and Barbara and Ron Anderton. We pray for Dave, uh, Bob's friend, for Marlene, for Maurice. We continue to lift up Pastor Mariko to you as she recovers after uh, the childbirth. And we thank you for uh, Erika and uh, Lord, just continue to be with their family. Father, we do uh, see all of these things going on in the world around us. And we, we pray for our nation and for our world. And we um, just lift up the situation in Afghanistan Lord, we lift up uh, Haiti to you, uh, Louisiana, and those affected by Hurricane Ida. We pray, Lord, for uh, rain, particularly in the western states that are experiencing drought and wildfires, Lord. And, uh, Father, we also do continue to lift up uh, families who've lost loved ones in this past year and Father, today as we remember Janet, uh, again, we just give thanks for her life, and we thank you for all that she meant uh, to us here at Bethany, and just for her example of quiet and humble service to you, Lord, and um, just the special person she was, and we lift up the Fukumura family to you, and, and we just have much gratitude in our hearts for Janet's life. We also, Father, uh, give thanks for Amina and for her birthday, and we just ask that you would bless her in this year ahead, and, um, and we, we thank you for her presence with us as well. Father, we do give you thanks for the opportunity to s support missionaries abroad, and we thank you for the Ramabai Mukti mission and our long partnership with them, and we ask that, uh, if, uh, that you would continue to sustain them, particularly during this difficult time as they've been through COVID and the Delta variant, Lord, that you would just um, uh, sustain their ministry and that they would be able to continue to reach those most in need, those women and children um, in India, Father. We do, Lord, give you thanks for our tithes and offerings, and we lift them up to you as an act of our worship. And we thank you for your provision for Bethany, your faithful provision. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us to be good stewards of what you've given us, that, Lord, that you would use our gifts for your kingdom purposes Father, not just here at Bethany Church, but um, in the greater Santa Barbara area and around the world. And so, Father, we do lift up this service of worship to you, our time in singing and in the word and just in remembering Janet today. We lift this whole service up to you, and we ask, Lord, that it would be to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we will be sharing just a clip from a special video that Glenn put together. And for those who are, uh, we have made that available just to the church members as a private YouTube. But if there are some who do not have access to YouTube, we will be showing it again in its entirety in the Koinonia room after the service. So you're welcome to watch it in its entirety after the service.
No? Oh, there I am. <laughs> uh, well, that was just a taste. There's about 10 more minutes of that video. So as Derek said, uh, we'll show it again uh, during coffee hour after you grab your snacks today, if you'd like to watch that. And we just want to give people an opportunity to share a little about their memories of Janet, if you would like. Um, you know, she... She really wanted us to be low-key about her memorial, so she only had a graveside service, and there were about 20 family members there for that day. And what I, I said that uh, she was just representative of so many saints around the world who work behind the scenes and that we, we don't know about, we won't know anything about until we get to heaven. And then... The Lord's going to reveal all these prayer warriors and people that work behind the scenes that didn't get up, get any front uh, headlines during their time on earth. And I just wanted to share one story that uh, struck me that uh, Jennifer shared with me when she said that uh, her parents would drop her off to church here and then they would leave. And so finally, when she got in the seventh grade, she said, well, you know, if you guys aren't going to stay for church, I'm not going to stay either. And so Janet and Tom got a little conviction, and uh, so they wanted Jennifer to keep coming, so they started coming to church. And I think you know the rest of the story, how involved Tom and Janet got as they started to attend church with Jennifer. And then Jennifer and Janet got baptized together here at the church and I think that's just a great story about how God works in amazing ways to reach people and as I said she worked behind the scenes did things that uh, most people didn't see keeping the kitchen straightened up and uh, helping with serving and fellowship and so I'd just like to open it up to anyone that would like to come up, or Derek will bring the microphone back to you if you'd like to share a memory or a thought about Janet. There's Jennifer. <laughs> I 
good for Jen. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. My mom was such a model to our family, and it's so nice to see that um, her teaching and her modeling are being um, seen in her grandkids. And um, we've been away quite a bit. We've been down in the Long Beach area um, visiting a lot of family and uh, just reminiscing about the memories and the um, joy that mom gave us every day. And so um, at the end, we were all here, and um, we knew it was her time to go see dad, and I know she'd missed him a lot. And uh, she went peacefully, and um, I'm sure the Lord greeted her with open arms. So we want to, um, our whole family wants to thank all of you, and they loved Bethany with all their hearts. So we've also been gone, and uh, we are moving. Um, our house is in escrow right now, and we will be moving down to the Long Beach area. Uh, we, had a, we have a house down there that we bought before we moved here. So um, that'll probably be in the next couple months. So um, thank you. Claire. So um, Janet was a very special person. When I was a single mom and first started coming to Bethany, she would give me advice when I would ask for it, and I always appreciated it. As years went by, she would continue to ask how my son Peter was doing. He'd grown up and moved to Japan for work. I always felt supported by her and enjoyed our many conversations. Um, Janet will not be forgotten. What a lovely person. Well, Mrs. Uh, Janet, because she was always ready to help in anything, and she was always very um, vocal and uh, um, very, um, really uh, helped us in our Bible studies. Well, Miss Janet, she was just a very kind person. Thank you, Barbara. Chicky. Janet was a very good friend of mine. We were in Bible study for many, many years, and she was very quiet, but she was one of those persons that I was doing things for the church, and I remember that she wanted things to be very neat, so she was always in the kitchen straightening things out or cleaning the refrigerator or things that you know many of us don't even think of. She would check for the um, uh, paper cups or anything that needed to be replaced. She always checked on those things and let Lloyd know, know that it needed to be replaced. But the most thing that I always remember about Janet and Tom was that at before Christmas, they were always going and buying the Christmas tree and had it fully decorated. And Janet made the um, Advent wreath every year. And, you know, I never got to thank them for doing that because when after Christmas, they always took the tree down. And, you know, you never had to do anything because those two did most of the work. And I really appreciated her doing all that, but Janet was so quiet, and she said to me once, I don't need any praise or thanks. And so I know that even if she's not here, I can always say that she was a good and faithful servant for the Lord. Thank you, Chicky. Would anybody else like to share? Um, uh, Janet and my mom uh, counted offering on Mondays for many, many years. And I know my mom really appreciated uh, what a good listener uh, Janet was. And she would say, she could keep the secret. You know, so she just really appreciated the confidence she could put in Janet and their times that they shared together. Uh, 
Oh yeah, Janet was um, truly a devoted wife and loving um, wife for Tom and a wonderful and caring mother for Jennifer and Glenn and her grandchildren. She always um, would encourage me um, and thank me for being a Sunday school teacher and that really, um, I really appreciated. Um, she was also a really good uh, made, uh, handmade um, articles that she wove. Beautiful table runners and scarves and other things. And she, I remember she would um, donate those articles for our church, uh, uh, Bethany's uh, raffle picnic at the picnic. And I just love those things. So I would put all my tickets in that one bag and I, and I, I, I won a couple of things. And I, uh, one thing that I really um, admire and love is a scarf that she had, um, had woven. And she was a good cook. She made so many good things at our potlucks, especially her desserts. And she, um, yeah, most of all, I will remember her, her gentle and quiet spirit and how she was a godly woman and a very faithful woman. So we thank the Lord that uh, Janet is with him now in his glory. Thank you, Denise. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I just want to say, I think what Denise said real fast said that Janet always encouraged, you know, she was quiet in her way, but she'd come up after church and I'd be out greeting people and she would always have a word of encouragement after giving, after I gave a message or something. And yeah, she, that was Janet, I think. Um, and just real fast, I'd like to thank uh, Tsugumi-san for providing these beautiful flowers, uh, altar flowers this morning in memory of Janet. So we thank Tsugumi for that. And now uh, if the worship team will come up and we will uh, sing praises to the Lord. All right, please join us in praise. You can uh, stand and, or you can stay seated. You can dance in the aisles, whatever you like. Today's theme is love. Love is what keeps the marriage together. And we're going to be talking about divorce proofing our marriages, but also just the principles that can apply to any any friendship and how love is the key. So we'll start with more love, more power. Thank you. 
Next is the power of your love, speaking of God's love for us. Make these your words to be changed and renewed. First verse in English, then the second verse Japanese, third verse in English. So 
eternally. Lord, thank you for your love, your amazing love. Thank you for your love that is not satisfied to keep us as we are, but renews us and changes us, helps us to become more like you. We praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, please take your seats. We'll have scripture reading by Hunter. Good morning, everyone. We'll be reading from Corinthians 13, 1 through 7. The way of love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. 
Love is patience and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Thank you, Hunter. As I mentioned, uh, today's message is not just for married folks. Um, so I know we have a lot of singles in our group. And first off, you never know when you may get married. I have known people that got married for the first time in their 60s. And I've also known people who've got married second or third time in their 70s and 80s. So you never know. And, but also, uh, the principles today apply to friendships and building strong friendships, except for the passion part. You might want to not include that. But we'll get to that. Uh, church clicker is getting a little worn out like me, so um, I may have to rely on the sound room today, but we'll see how it goes. One, one person's definition of marriage is marriage is an institution where two people come together to jointly solve problems that they never had before they got married. <laughs> so, uh, maybe that's your case. Yeah. Problems will continually come up. And so divorce proofing is a necessary thing, I think. And it's not just a one and done kind of thing. It's an ongoing process. Uh, heard a story about a couple that was married for 75 years and the husband was celebrating his 100th birthday. And people said, wow, how do you stay in such good physical condition? And he said, friends, I take lots of long walks out in the open fresh air. And they asked, how do you stay so disciplined to do that for, 70, for 100 years? And he said, well, my wife and I made a pact when we got married that whenever we had an argument, Whoever was proved wrong would go out and take a long walk. Yeah. So he got, the, he got the long walks most of the time. Uh, at this couple, they, they realized that a commitment was important, right? Um, but divorce proofing a marriage is kind of like fireproofing your home, I think. You know, when you want to fireproof your home, you get a fire extinguisher, you get fire resistant roofing put in smoke alarms, clear the brush from around the house, and then it requires maintenance. It's not just once and done. You have to get the batteries replaced and the smoke alarms. You have to keep the gutters clean. You have to keep the brush, especially if you're on a hillside in California, you need to keep clearing the brush from around your house and keep it safe. And so it's an ongoing process. And it's the same with marriage. There's an initial commitment, and then there's a lot of maintenance to do afterwards. One, one book on marriage by Les and Leslie Perot says that there's three things that really help to keep a marriage together, and that's commitment, passion, and intimacy. And so I want to look today at 1 Corinthians 13 and also a few verses from Song of Solomon and Proverbs 5 to give us some insights on how to maintain uh, commitment, passion, and intimacy in your marriage. So our first point is strong marriages and strong friendships need realistic expectations. Now, I've written in your uh, handout in the bulletin, there's four common myths about marriage that young people will often have. First, first myth, is that we will have the same expectations of marriage. <clears throat> this is not true. Uh, you will have some expectations that are the same. Maybe you say, well, we know that we want to live in Santa Barbara, or we know that we want to have two children or three children. But there's a lot of things that will come up that you'll find out you have different expectations on. 
like maybe what kind of a car to buy or how much to spend on clothes, how much to spend on hobbies, how to spend your free time. There's just a lot of, a lot of differences that will come up or whose who's family are we gonna spend Christmas with? You know, there's lots of different expectations that you might come, come to marriage with. And the second thing is everything that is good now will just get better. That's another expectation that sometimes young people have. But again, not true. Some things will get better. Um, but after a while, we realize that we didn't marry the person that we thought we did. <laughs> I found out that I, <laughs> I thought I married an extrovert. And, and some of you have probably thought, Jan, well, Jan's an extrovert. And when she's in a group of people that she knows, I mean, she's, she's a firefly, you know, just full of life and energy. But I came to find out if she doesn't know anybody in the group, then she's kind of like this, you know. And uh, so I was quite surprised. Um, and when we get married, we tend to look at the other person with the rose-colored glasses, and uh, you know, we just see the good things about them. And then after after a few months, uh, we start to see the flaws and the weaknesses and things that we didn't see before. And most marriage therapists say that the initial romance kind of starts fading after three months to three years, uh, somewhere in there. Um, one attorney said that the number one reason that people get divorced is they refuse to believe that they married a human being. You know? <laughs> in other words, uh, we think we've married a perfect person, and, uh, but we didn't marry God. You know, we... We all have imperfections, we all have that sinful flesh and that selfishness and weaknesses. We all get tired and grumpy at times and we have to remember we're married to another human being. And then the third, uh, third myth, we'll get back here. Everything bad in my life will disappear. This is called the Cinderella Syndrome. You know, they got married and lived happily ever after. Um, many people grow up in a bad environment, maybe an abusive home or alcoholic parents or uh, parents who were divorced when they were young and they've, they've got a lot of wounds. And so they're looking for that partner like Cinderella, you know, the prince that will just be kind of marriage therapy for them and just and just take care of everything and heal everything and marriage just isn't like that some things do get better when you get married so i don't want to be a pessimist derek and get you worried or anything uh, but there are things that are challenges and as uh i said earlier new problems do appear but if you go into marriage realizing that it's an adventure and it's something that we got to work on, we don't know what's going to happen, but it can be an adventure and we can work together. And I kind of think it's kind of like a working vacation. You know, there are a lot of things that do get better in your life and you can, you can really have enjoyable times together, but you have to work a little bit to keep things uh, safe and strong. So the fourth one is, the fourth m myth is that my spouse will make me whole. This again is a not true expectation. And I should say it, maybe it's partially, partially true. As the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, one person will sharpen another. So you can say, well, we're going to sharpen each other. We're both going to get better. And in a healthy marriage, we do help each other grow. And it's also true that opposites tend to attract. And so often you will marry someone who complements some areas that you don't have. Like maybe your partner's really good with finances and you don't really like to do, do finances. Or your partner's really handy at 
maintenance or cooking, and you aren't. And so you can complement each other in a lot of things. But we shouldn't come into a marriage just thinking, oh, my partner is just going to make me whole and complete my life. Because the only one that can really make us whole is the Lord. And we need to remember that he's the one that can change us. That if we go into a marriage thinking, well, I'm going to change my partner in this way and that way. You know, we're, we're bound to be disappointed. If they don't want to be changed then it's going to be hard to change them. But God can change anyone. But we need to focus on changing ourselves and growing ourselves, and then we can help our partner grow as well. So it's got to be a mutual thing of growing. And the essential thing to grow is love. So point two, agape love is essential, as we read as Hunter read for us, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have all prof prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge and have all faith to move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. And if I give away all I have and deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So Paul is basically saying agape love is essential for human relationships and especially for marriage and if we if we don't love we're just an irritation taking up space on the planet you know he says you're just you're just an irritating noisy thing if you don't have love and without love we're just going to not accomplish much of anything especially in a marriage and so putting love Love means putting the interests of the other above our own. And when you love, uh, when you love God and you love other people, as Jesus said, the, the first two most important commandments, then you'll be fulfilling your purpose for being on earth. And so love is essential. And then love is a commitment. Verse 7 I've thrown in, in the parentheses are some of the other translations uh, in the Bible, other ways that these words are translated. But love bears all things, or it's also, it covers, covers all things or protects all things. And love believes all things, or it, it trusts things. And love hopes. It has a expectation and anticipation of some good things that will come and love endures it it waits with patience and it perseveres and so there's this four-part breakdown you could say that uh, bears all things for instance if you've been married a while and then your wife gets really sick go, well I didn't commit to this you know no you you bear all things that come, come about. Or if husband loses his job, well, I didn't commit to this. No, you have to bear, bear all things. And the same believes all things. And so you want to believe in your partner, believe that they, they are committed, believe that um, they want to work to make your marriage better. The third one hopes all things. And so you have a hope in an anticipation that you can grow together, that you can work through difficulties and that good things will come. And it's, I think if you hope all things, it's a safe feeling. You have a feeling of security, which is especially important to women to have that feeling of security in the marriage. And the fourth part, uh, love perseveres and endures really stresses the commitment to persevere and endure even when things are not going well, when there's money problems, or when there's hurts, or there's arguments, uh, family issues. Um, this is where we need to remember that marriage is a covenant and not a contract. 
You know, I recently read the, a difference between contract and covenant. When you have a contract, many of you have had uh, contracts to have work done in your house maybe, and the contract is basically, you know, you do this and then I will pay you. If you don't do this, then I won't do this. And so a contract is conditional. And it's actually built on not trusting. You're, you're assuming, you're just assuming the other person will try to cheat you if you don't have a contract. And so some marriages start off with a prenuptial agreement, which is kind of like a contract. And it's, it's really kind of a bad sign to feel that you need a contract before the marriage because you're, you're basically saying it's a conditional thing. Well, if they do this, then I'm not going to do this. And so the commitment in marriage is really a covenant. A covenant is unconditional. It's like when Abraham said, or God said to Abraham, go to this country and I will promise to bless you and I will give you many descendants and you will be a blessing and all the earth will be blessed through you. Once Abraham went, the, the covenant was set and God was going to keep those promises no matter what, what Abraham did. And God is still keeping those promises. So a, gov a covenant is something that you continually work on as God is continuing to fulfill the covenant that he made with Abraham, we too have to continually fulfill the covenant that we made with our spouse. So if you're a guy here that's married to someone, you probably said something similar to this. And the pastor will say to the man, will you have this woman to be your wife, to live together with her in the covenant of marriage? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her? And forsaking all others, be faithful unto her as long as you both shall live. And I hope you men out there will say, I do, to your partners. And then we usually have the men repeat this. In the name of God, I take you, the bride, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. And this is my solemn vow. And the vow is the same for the wife. And this is, this is a covenant that you make with each other when you get married. And notice that it says until, as long as we both shall live. So it's a covenant till one of you passes away. And so I hope that you remember those and maybe recommit to those today or sometime. And just remember that you are committed no matter what comes your way in that marriage. That's, that's a covenant. That's an unconditional promise. It's not like the uh, guy I heard about one time. They were seeing a marriage counselor and the wife says, We've been married 30 years, and he never tells me that he loves me. And the husband responded, I told you on our wedding day I loved you, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of cold, but it's a covenant, you know. It's a, uh, and marital love requires passion. Okay, now we're getting into the PG-13 part of the message, but... Passion is both sensual and sexual. Uh, when we first get married, it's, the hormones are running strong. And most, mar most marriages start out with a lot of passion and a lot of hormones. But as time goes on, hormones might decrease. And so passion might decrease as well. But I would say we're never too old for skinship. That's what they call it in Japan. When you touch skin, when you shake, shake hands, that's skinship in Japan, or hand-holding. Greeting each other with a kiss is still 
a common greeting in the Middle East. Uh, when Jan and I were in Turkey, we were just amazed at how women greeted each other with a kiss and the men greeted each other with a kiss on the cheek. And so kissing is important. It's, uh, oh, it's right there. Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. <clears throat> so I figure if old men can kiss each other when they greet that uh, we should still be kissing our spouses even into old age. And skin, you know, the skin is the largest and most sensitive organ in the human body. And God designed it to be sensitive to touch and to pain. And he designed it to be pleasurable. He said that husband and wife are to come together and be one. And so even into old age, you know, you can still have that skinship. You can still cuddle under the covers. Uh, and Proverbs 5, 18 to 21 talks about the importance of keeping that skinship together. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's eyes are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his paths. So a great way to divorce proof your marriage is to keep that skinship alive and not allow the other person to start wandering, looking for skinship somewhere else. And then there's one more thing, intimacy. Now you might've thought, well, passion and intimacy, intimacy sounds like the same thing. And we have one definition of intimacy. If you say, oh, they have an intimate relationship that you might think they have a physical relationship the original definition of intimacy was just to know each other intimately, emotionally. And that's, that's what um, the marriage counselors are talking about. The commitment, passion, and intimacy. Intimacy is that emotional intimacy where you really get to know each other and trust each other and are open with each other and you're transparent with each other and you become deep friends with one another. And you have this trust in each other. And that has to be built up, oh, sorry, with uh, these other verses in 1 Corinthians that were read. Very well known. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And the way we apply that to marriage and friendship, you have to be patient and kind with one another. If you display impatience, your partner is not going to relax and be open. And in fact, they'll probably stop talking because if we get impatient, then they're going to be worried that we're going to start getting irritated and resentful like in uh, the end of verse 4, um, or verse 5, sorry. And we might ins start insisting on our own way. And if, you've, if you feel like you have to walk on eggshells when you're talking with your spouse, then you're just not going to be able to build up that intimacy that you need to have. Because as you build up the emotional intimacy then the passion also comes. But if you're boastful and arrogant and rude rather than humble, your partner is not going to want to be open with you. If you're not able to say, I'm sorry, and if you get defensive when the other person is giving you loving truth, that last part of that rejoices with the truth. So when your partner lovingly tells you that you acted like a real jerk around your friends, um, do you get defensive or do you 
rejoice with that truth that they have shared with you. Um, believe me, I have not always been perfect at rejoicing in the painful truths that Jan shares with me, but uh, <laughs> um, that's what God calls us to do. That's how you can build that emotional intimacy. If you're willing to be humble rather than arrogant and rejoice when they lovingly tell you the truth. And so I want to just sum up with uh, building intimacy really is covered by these verses four, five, and six. And next week I'll talk a little bit more about communication in marriage and that, that really kind of builds on this last part of building intimacy is really, really requires some good communication skills in how to do that. And of course, um, there are some marriages, if only one partner is willing to apply these principles, it makes it really difficult. And if you're in an abusive relationship, especially if physical abuse, you know, then you need to separate. And so I want to emphasize that um, divorce proofing requires both people to cooperate in this process. And so just to review quickly, to have realistic expectations, remember you're both human with weaknesses and flaws, and you need to focus on changing yourself and not the other person. And love is essential. Focus on the other and not on yourself. Marriage is an unconditional covenant built on love and trust, and it's not a conditional contract. Maintain the passion, physical touching, kissing, skinship, and continue building emotional intimacy. So remember, it requires regular maintenance, and maybe part of that maintenance might be speaking with a marriage counselor, or pastor, or just, just an older couple that will be mentors to you. We all need to uh, get that regular maintenance and, and just make sure that we're not keeping some uh, resentments that, that may cause damage in the future. So with that, let us pray and we'll have one more song. Lord, I thank you for the gift of marriage and I thank you for your gift of love. Lord, help us to love one another as you love us and help us especially to love our spouses and help us to mature and grow to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, if the praise team can come up, we will sing a song that was sung at our wedding. Um, oh, perfect love. And if you could, if you could stand and join us, uh, if you would like, or you may stay seated, that's fine too. So this is a song that would be sung to the couple getting married. <clears throat> oh, perfect love.
And for our doxology today, we'll sing through one time, I love you, Lord. John, benediction, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Please join us in the courtyard for the snacks celebrating Amina's birthday, and then we will also have a video in the Koinonia room after you get your snacks if you would like to join that.